the Joe Rogan experience. It doesn't mean just because you don't like Trump as an individual that suddenly you're okay with hard left policies. Right. But I think the Democrats make that mistake. They think they're, they're, they think that that's the solution to Trump. Go right. as far away from him as possible. Yeah, and, then, and the then you can't find a center. I think yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's the solution. I think the solution is somewhere in the center. And when, when you see shit like what's happening in Portland and Seattle, I think <sighs> people are more aware than ever now that civil unrest is like, it's, it's very strange. It's very strange to watch them try to break into that. What, what was the building in Portland they were trying uh, to break into? The Hatfield into? Uh, Courthouse, uh, yeah. uh, the federal courthouse. Yeah. Well, that was insane. Yeah. Watching yeah. that was insane. I, d I don't understand the motivation. Like the, well, there's, connecting you, you, yeah. that to how, I, how do you connect that in Portland, the most liberal city in the country? How do you, pr how do you uh, ar arguably, right? Probably the most liberal. Yeah. The yeah. most progressive. Seattle, yeah, uh, Portland. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. How do you connect that to Black Lives Matter? I mean, how do you connect that to George Floyd's death? How do you connect that to why? 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 I just don't understand. Why would you try to break into the courthouse? They're, they're trying to recreate what went wrong, what didn't work in Seattle. Right, that whole uh, zone, Chaz you know, autonomous or Chop zone. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, that didn't work. I mean, that was nonsense. It was crazy. You made a worse version of America in six blocks. It's like one of those little, tiny, uh, little. You know, like if you took like a glass dome and you put like little animals in there and you let them eat each other alive. Like <laughs> yeah. that was like we're gonna we're gonna create utopian glass. Like yeah. they, they made a worse version of the United States. They put up borders immediately. They stopped people from coming in. They had armed guards. They wind up uh, using police tech. They didn't have cops, but they have people that act like cops and beat the fuck out of people for filming. Right. The whole thing right. was madness. They, no. they had murders. It was, it was well, crazy. It's, it was it's, quick. It's, um, I mean, look, uh, Portland, I, I know Portland extremely well. My parents, you know, lived uh, in Portland for uh, a couple of decades. It's a beautiful you know? place. It's, uh, it used to be a, really, a hell of a place, but... Over the years, and, and you know, I, I know Republicans and Democrats who feel the same way who are in Portland and the surrounding area, and they all feel like this place is, is slowly, you know, circling down a toilet because of local and state uh, management, right? And so uh, what happened in Portland, not really a surprise. You know, it's, it's the same the, – the, the people that, 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 that do this sort of activity, right, that, that you know, uh, have been referred to as Antifa or anarchists or whatever. They're the, the same sort of trustafarian, you know, bottom-feeding folks in, in really any city in the world who engage in a WTO protest because it's cool to get out there and protest. I don't understand the mentality, but if you try to figure out a motivation for them, you know, you'll lose your mind because they really don't have one. You could take 10 of those people out of Portland – who are engaged in sort of the, the violent activity and ask them, well, why are you doing this? And you'll get 10 different answers. I do think a lot of this is coming from empathy, which is a good thing. And I, I have to say, you know, I, with regard to the, the issue of transitioning children, I do support traditioning in adults. I yes. think it can help adults who are transgender. I think if you were an adult, you, it's your decision, it's your body, it's no one's place to tell you what to do. But I think a lot of this is coming from, so I grew up in the gay community and I remember seeing how homophobic people could be toward my friends, uh, and I think things have changed. Things have gotten better in some ways. I think homophobia still exists, and we can talk about that because I do talk about how that affects a lot of what we're seeing in the book. But I think for a lot of people, they look at that and they say, okay, we were wrong about that. We were wrong to treat gay people differently. We were wrong to say that being gay is something you can change. So now they've gone completely in the opposite direction saying, okay, no matter what anyone says with regard to their identity, with regard to their gender, this is something that we should not challenge. We should fully support. And if you question it in any way, even in the most nuanced or sensitive way, as I try to, and as I think you do, that's still not acceptable. Yeah. That's what's strange. It's, it's an ideology. It's rigid. It's like a religion. It is. It is. I think I find people who are, you know, middle of the road, they're not sure what to think. If they read my work or they talk to me, they say, oh, wow, I never th I never realized that I didn't know the science said that. And they change their perspective. But I think for some people, if they are very much invested in the identity or very, very invested in activism or for whatever reason, this ideology means something to them. It's you cannot you just cannot reason with them. It doesn't matter what the science says, they will find something to pick at. And especially with desistance, which is that that um, the research I was mentioning where it shows that most kids will not feel gender dysphoric anymore when they reach puberty. 
they they just people some people cannot accept it and they will call you transphobic they'll call you bigoted and you know i don't think i'm any of those things i'm really just trying to help prevent these children from making potentially a very bad decision that they're going to regret and especially now um, we're seeing in the uk that this is happening where more detransitioners are saying this was something i regret this was a mistake why did the adults not challenge me i really think so right now we're in august 2020 i think within the five next five years or maybe a little bit longer we're going to be seeing an explosion of children coming out and saying i did not want to transition this was a mistake and it's really going to be awful well, we're already seeing that. There's a lawsuit that was uh, very prominent in the UK recently about a, a young girl right. who transitioned to be... Do you know the lawsuit I'm talking about? I do, yeah. yeah. Kira Bell. Yeah. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking because they, she's essentially ruined her body to the point where she's not going to be able to have children. She's She'll, you know, she in, in many cases, a lot of these girls can't have orgasms ever again. No. Exactly. Yeah. And but I think in North America we are still very much in denial about this. If if I mean whenever I am on a show, if I'm on TV and I talk about this, the backlash after is just crazy and I'm thinking people need to wake up. We're, I'm trying to stop this from happening, right? The whole point of writing this book and saying these things is trying to prevent what's about to happen. It's important, you know, I can't help talking about the death penalty when we talk about Shorty Clemente because in this country, a lot of people still believe in the death penalty, and I don't. Um, and what I say to people who believe in the death penalty is, I respect your view, but what percentage of innocent people are you okay with executing, right? Because the system is fundamentally flawed. And even if the system was reformed in all the ways that we could sit here and think of, right, and I have some ideas on that, there's still going to be errors. There's always going to be, there are always going to be errors made. And... So you have to accept that there are going to be mistakes. We know that, like in Florida, where Josh represents James Daly, and again, we did a podcast episode about his case as well, um, James is either going to be the 100th guy executed by the state of Florida or the 30th guy exonerated from death row. Yeah, Clemente was the 29th, and I'm representing who should be the 30th. So they're not, even if all the people they executed were guilty, and we know they weren't, right? We know certain people like Jesse Tefero, who was absolutely innocent, executed by the state of Florida, in that gruesome execution where the electric chair, quote unquote, malfunctioned and his head caught on fire, and they had to ex electrocute him three times. But even if they got those right, they aren't even batting 700, right? Ugh. And then in, in Louisiana, you know, to your point before, Joe, um, a guy named John Thompson, rest in peace, was a good friend of mine. Um, he came within a month of being executed by the state of Louisiana when an attorney, uh, investigator, staring into a microscope and saw the DNA evidence that proved that he was not guilty of this murder and he was ultimately exonerated. And he wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times where he said, I don't understand why the prosecutor who prosecuted, because he proved that they knew he was innocent before they prosecuted him, right? He knew it, and, and it was absolutely proven that was not in question. So he said, I don't understand why that prosecutor is not being charged with attempted murder. They tried to kill me, and they knew I was innocent, and I've proven that. But and what know, happens to the prosecutor? Nothing. 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 This Nothing. is. I've been saying this for a long time, that there's a real problem with human beings when it comes to anything where there's a game. And the problem with policing and prosecuting people and convicting people and it's a game and meaning that there's winners and losers and when when there's winners and losers people cheat there's a lot of people with poor character and they just want to win and they get caught up in this game i mean you can call it a game you can call it a pursuit whatever you want to call it there's a there's an end that you want to achieve if you're successful and if you if you don't achieve that end you are unsuccessful so when people are trying to achieve this end they will do all kinds of things. You know, the thing about Farley was um, he uh, he and Spade used to fight over me like I was the girl. <laughs> Probably because, let's face it, I kind of look like a girl in certain lighting. Um, and uh, they'd be like, I heard you were in the jacuzzi with Rob last night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you didn't call me. Well, and they, they, they would like fight. It was it was very funny and, and sweet. One night I took uh, I took the gang out to... Barbarian Steakhouse in Toronto. Great steak. I don't know if they're still there. Chris ordered two bone-in, two bone-in steak, uh, porterhouse steaks, ate both of them. But on top of each bite, he put a cube of butter. <laughs> and when I 
looked at him like, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? He was like, <coughs> it needs a hat. <laughs> so if you want to put a hat on your steak. Some people just genuinely don't give a fuck. No fucks given. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, he's a wild man. I met him once on the set of uh, News Radio. He's partying with Andy Dick. Oh, He boy. showed up gray like wet cardboard. He looked gray. And I'm like, hey, man. He's like, hey, hey. It was just, he was gone. Oh. It was, it was sad. It was weird. He had gray skin. And I remember thinking, Jesus Christ, Chris Farley has gray skin. Like, what's going on? Like, he was sweaty and just, just all fucked up. Yeah, he, he had major, major demons. Uh, and a lot of us really worked, you know, we're, we're worked out for, you know, but, you know, it's, some people can't, they can't make that leap, man. They the thing about him, though, leap. is the fucking I always wonder about guys like that that are so powerful. Like, is it the demons that made him so good? He was so good. So good. When he would go ape shit. I mean, he had the, the fucking horsepower he had. It was so stunning. Like yeah. when you have these scenes when he would just go fucking crazy. It was so fun. And I, you would wonder, like, what is, is that same thing what makes him? I mean, because it was so real. Is that what made him just go crazy with coke and go crazy with everything well, else? I mean, I think I think like normal people, like I don't see a lot of normal people drawn. Well, why would any normal person want to be in entertainment? Right. Right. I mean, why, why would they? Right. So, I think just by default, damaged people or people with a more 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 articulately people with a hole to fill are drawn to entertainment to fill the hole. 